Today, we have the honor of having Gerard McCarthy pre present in this AMOC webinar series. Gerard is an observational physical oceanographer specializing in the AMOC with particular interest in the role of the ocean on climate and sea level. He is currently a lecturer and researcher at the Irish Climate Analysis and Research Units at Maynooth University in Ireland. Before that, he was a senior research fellow with the RAPID project. Within the past year, he received the IOPSO Early Career Research Award, as well as the Maynooth University Early Career Award. He also led the AGU Special Collection paper in which, the, in which this presentation is covering, entitled Sustainable Observations of the AMOC Methodology and Technology. So with that, we are very happy to have you here today, Gerard. Please go ahead when you are ready. Super, thanks a million, Jenny. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, so as Jenny said, I would like to present today uh, the review paper that we did on sustainable methodology and technology of measuring the AMOC. So this paper was a, a highly collaborative effort uh, with 18 authors from 12 institutions and across six nations. So in the paper, we reviewed the techniques and technologies used for measuring and uh, to some extent as well, reconstructing the AMOC. These included the technologies used in transport mooring arrays like RAPID and OSNAP and SAMBA and, and, and others, uh, including dynamic height moorings, pies and current meters, and also included looking at some existing technology and techniques um, such as remote sensing, ADCPs on volunteering observing ships, uh, gliders, bottom pressure recorders, and all of these are either beginning to be integrated into AMOC observing systems or have the potential to be integrated into AMOC observing systems in the future. So to start off with, uh, I'll present this figure here from the paper. This presents uh, an overview of the um, observing systems that are currently deployed in the Atlantic. Uh, some of them aren't actually still deployed, um, but these are, these are approximately the uh, observing systems in the Atlantic measuring the overturning circulation. We've come an awful long way in terms of AMOC observing system in the past 20 years. Uh, if I were to go back 20 years ago, I don't think there would be very many of these lines on, on this figure. So all of these green dash lines illustrate the location of AMOC observing systems. I think the only ones that would still exist actually are across the Greenland Scotland Ridge where measurements began in the, the mid 1990s and at 53 North in the Labrador Sea also. Um, the earliest Hydrographic measurements that are that are contained here in Ovid um, go back to 1997, but the Ovid section wasn't regularly occupied until after 2002. So really, we're, when we talk about in situ AMOC observing, we are talking about the past 20 years. Now, this is a, a, a very good system in comparison to where we've come from, so we've come an awful long way, but there are still some observational gaps. Um, frequently, the shallow regions on the continental shelf are un unobserved. Deep flows, um, including the flow of Antarctic bottom water, pose a lot of problems as they are they, they themselves are weak and often difficult to detect against the background of energetic ocean mesoscale. There's also some parametric and technological gaps um, that I'll talk about in, uh, in, in this talk. Technology is just about emerging uh, to uh, allow the accurate est estimation of some biogeochemical parameters, and we still don't get uh, real-time data back from the majority of these moorings. So there are, in spite of how far we've come, there's still an awful lot that remains to be done. And in terms of putting sustain, putting these observations on a sustainable footing, there's a, there is a lot of work ongoing and still to do. So I think I'm going to present this paper a little bit backwards, um, probably starting from where I started in the, the summary and the discussion in the paper, and then, then working back to the introduction in some sense. So in spite of um, the AMOC only being observed for the last 20 years or so, um, the AMOC is actually very simple to measure. The AMOC by itself is, of course, just velocities. Uh, so in the subtropics, say, for example, at the rapid array, all you need to do is sum up all the velocities going north in the Florida current and the Gulf Stream, um, subtract off the bits that are coming back south in, in the, the warm recirculation of the gyre, and then balance that with southward flowing North Atlantic deep water, uh, upper and or, upper and lower North Atlantic deep water. That's essentially the AMOC. It's just just velocities. Uh, similarly, at uh, OSNAP in the subpolar North Atlantic, what you need to do there, of course, is just switch your vertical coordinate from depth to density, and then you can capture the warm water that is flowing in at the uh, eastern side of the subpolar gyre and out uh, much colder water flowing out at the uh, 
western side near Greenland. And then, of course, it just goes around Labrador Sea and doesn't overturn at all. And so that's all you're really trying to do. So in some sense, measuring velocity is pretty straightforward. Um, we know how to make measurements of velocity. We have a number of different te technologies that can do this, including acoustic dots. So, for example, you might, if you were starting off from first principles, want to monitor the, uh, the global radio and low overturning circulation. You might want to design uh, a big array that covers the whole of the globe and measures velocity everywhere. Of course, we're not only interested in velocity, we're not only interested in AMOC, we're interested in the heat and fresh water. And probably these days, the carbon fluxes associated with the AMOC. But that's still pretty straightforward. All you have to do is co-locate a temperature or salinity or a carbon measurement with your velocity measurements. Um, so this, of course, has been done before in some sense. Um, this figure here is taken from the 1998, the very influential paper led by Dean Romick um, from the Argo Steering Committee. This was the theoretical design for an Argo array, so a global array of profiling floats. Now, if we were thinking about doing something like that using um, an array of moorings for velocity and temperature and uh, salinity, it would be an amazing data set, but it would be a, an absolutely madcap adventure. Of course, the individual moorings themselves would cost an awful lot of money, so the instrumentation would cost would be wildly expensive. And that's before you take a ship out to service any one of these moorings. So uh, no AMOC observing system takes this approach, of course, and there's a couple of reasons why the AMOC observing system has, observed, has evolved to be the way it is. Um, and I'm just going to go through a few of those uh, to begin with. So first of all, the, the big trick is that the AMOC is geostrophic. So large scale ocean circulation is geostrophic. And that means you only really need to measure at the boundaries. So we can tell that the ocean is geostrophic in terms of the large scale. Um, so I could have put in a number of different figures here, but this one is taken from um, a, a, a paper by Emma Worthington under consideration in ocean science discussions at the moment, um, where we have uh, we have a hydrographic section across 26 degrees north. And because of geostrophy, we can read the circulation from this. So we can see that the thermocline uh, increases with depth as we move to the west, which indicates southward flowing thermocline water. We can see that the water masses of the North Atlantic deep water lean against the western boundary here. This is the upper North Atlantic deep water and lower North Atlantic deep water. And we can see that Antarctic bottom water leans against the western flank of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So we know that this is geostrophic flow, that the large scale overturning circulation is geostrophic. And that gives you a great advantage. That means you don't actually have to measure in the middle of the ocean. You only have to measure along the boundaries. So if you measure the dynamic height on either end of the boundaries, provided that your basin is a pretty good approximation for um, for a rectangle, which um, sometimes it is, um, you you don't need to be worrying about making measurements in the in, in the ocean interior. Now, that's a very good thing. We don't really want to go near the ocean interior um, for a number of reasons, actually. So this is actually a, a figure describing the uh, distribution of plastic in the world's oceans. So why on earth am I showing you a picture of the distribution of plastic in the world oceans when I'm talking about AMOC observing? So if we're thinking about the types of technology that are correct or that are good for measuring the AMOC, um, this is a very relevant figure. So we can see that Ekman currents and uh, figure B here um, acts to pile up plastic in the middle of the great ocean gyres. And that gives us the great ocean gar garbage patches that we're all familiar with. If we look at what geostrophic currents do to the same plastic, they just spread it out everywhere. So the geostrophic currents just act to be very, very divergent and spread the plastic throughout the whole of the world's oceans. There's actually an implication for how you would measure ocean circulation in that. So it means that passive instruments such as Argo or drifters will not measure geostrophic currents properly because they're just going to be pushed away from where the action of the currents are. I could have shown you another picture here as well, which would be the distribution of the Argo floats proportional to sea surface height gradients. So sea surface height gradients are where the ocean circulation really is. And if we look at where the distribution of Argo floats are relative to that, you would find that there's um, no Argo floats where there's a sharp SSH gradient. So those passive sensors are no good for measuring the overturning circulation. 
It's an important point that we don't need to measure everywhere. So there's a lot of connectivity, there's a lot of coherence in the world's oceans, probably more than, um, certainly I suppose when I started working with, with rapid, actually more than I would have maybe thought there was. This figure here gives a nice illustration of it. It's um, a paper by Joel Hershey and co-authors um, looking at the, the variability of the loop current. So um, th they were looking at the loop current in the, the Gulf of Mexico here. But what this figure actually shows, this time series is the Florida Straits transport, which is uh, located inside here. And when we look at the sea surface velocities associated with the fluctuations of the Florida current, we can see that the Gulf Stream is actually coherent over very, very large distances all the way up to Cape Hatteras. So you measure in one place and you know what's happening over a large expanse. So you don't have to measure everywhere. I could also have shown you a figure from uh, Bingham, uh, Rory Bingham et al, um, who looked at the meridional coherence in the North Atlantic AMOC uh, many years ago. And what this shows here is, so this is a correlation plot, um, and this is, a, this is whatever version of Had, Hadley, uh, the Hadley climate model they were using at the time, and this is an Occam model. And this high correlation shows that basically there's a high degree of correlation between all of the subtropical North Atlantic and a high degree of correlation between all of the subpolar North Atlantic. So the circulation is essentially coherent on these type of basin scale meridional distances. So you don't need to measure everywhere. So again, thinking back on our uh, theoretical array of uh, three by three degrees uh, current meters, you don't need to do anything like that at, at all. The other thing that we have is that many of the key circulation elements are flowing through very constricted areas. So this is a cross section across the Greenland Scotland Ridge. Uh, the Greenland Scotland Ridge acts as a bathymetric constraint um, on the deep waters of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. The circulation essentially is warm waters going, warm shallow waters going northwards and cold deep waters coming back south, uh, made up mainly of North Atlantic deep water. Uh, the lowest, densest version of that comes across the Greenland Scotland Ridge, and it basically comes across in two locations, across the Fair Bank Channel and through the Denmark Straits. Um, and these are very constricted bathymetric regions. So Boya Hansen and colleagues in the Faroe Islands are, have been telling us for many years that the overflow in the Fairbank Channel, where you get about um, about half of this um, deep, dense North Atlantic deep water coming across, um, can be monitored fairly well with just one ADCP mooring. So that's a lucky, lucky situation. So that's just a bit of background to kind of understand how we've ended up with this type of AMOC observing system. So we have uh, practically got these observing systems uh, every um, in each basin, so Samba takes up the, the southern part of the South Atlantic. The tropical South Atlantic array is in the tropical South Atlantic. We've got move and rapid to the tropical and subtropical North Atlantic, and then we've got a number of arrays in the subpolar North Atlantic. So the AMOC observing has evolved really around um, fixed, limited locations. And the gold standard are these tra transport mooring arrays. This is a nice cross section of the OSNAP array. Um, the OSNAP array uh, uses a combination of dynamic height moorings from which geostrophic currents can be measured and direct current meter observations from which they can estimate the basin wide transport. There is also a, a, a tentative inclusion of glider based transports, um, uh, glider -based transports in the uh, over the, the shallow rock all Hatton plateau as well. So not just moorings, and I think that's actually an important point, particularly when we're kind of thinking about how these arrays might move, might evolve going forward, that it's not, um, they're not defined by the technology, uh, they're defined by the scientific problem that is how best to measure the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. So transport mooring arrays are the gold standard in terms of AMOC, uh, AMOC measuring. Dynamic height moorings and direct current meter moorings are, uh, make up most of them. And they're focused around these, these kind of constricted areas around the boundaries and um, are spaced out by about a base, a, about a, a basin width. So there's a number of technologies that are not as widely integrated into them. So we'll just talk about one, uh, a number of these. So PIs and SSH. So PIs are pressure inverted echo sounders. 
Uh, these are deployed. These are relatively cheap and low cost instruments, which can be deployed and measure the speed of sound from the ocean seafloor to the surface. Um, provided there's a, a, a single relationship between that speed of sound and the density structure, you can derive uh, the circulation from it. In some sense, there's a similarity. The type gives you the height or the height anomaly. It's probably more correct given what we know about the geoid. The height anomaly of the water column, again, from which you can estimate um, from which you can estimate the ocean circulation. Now, it doesn't always work in the sense that there are certain places where either the existing hydrography for building up a database relating to a single measurement to a density structure uh, doesn't work, or certain types of density changes give you kind of a, a, a double definition in terms of what, what it might be related to. But nonetheless, they, they offer an important kind of complementary bit of technology to the, um, to, to the um, uh, transport mooring arrays. Bottom pressure is um, used by a number of these arrays, but probably not in terms of an operational product. Uh, bottom pressure, so if we were here uh, as meteorologists, we might be talking about sea level pressure. We'd be taking the difference between two different points of sea level pressure and talking about the circulation or the wind between them. In the ocean, measuring pressure is a little bit more tricky, um, given the high densities of uh, the high densities of the water column in particular. However, it has been suggested, particularly, I guess, by Chris Hughes uh, in, in, in NOC or in the University of Liverpool, um, that bottom pressure can be used to estimate uh, circulation, potentially capturing coherent signatures all the way around the boundary. And certainly when we think about how um, the mooring arrays, the dynamic height arrays are focused around the boundaries, essentially that's what we're trying to estimate with them, is the pressure signal on the boundaries. So if we had an absolute pressure sensor that could accurately estimate the, the ocean bottom pressure, then there would be a great advantage to it. And not only that in terms of an absolute parametric estimation, but the actual coherence of it. So that's what's shown in this figure here. Uh, you can see very similar signatures. Um, so let me explain this figure a little bit more. So along the bottom here, we've got a scale from one to six that corresponds to locations one to six around the boundary of the Atlantic. And you can see consistent signals, these are EUFs one and two, uh, stretching over very, very large distances um, all the way around the Atlantic Basin. So that this bottom pressure signal is really capturing elements of the ocean circulation that travel all the way around the Atlantic and, and are really kind of coherent through it. Measuring bottom pressure isn't actually as straightforward as all that. Um, they, they are known to suffer from very large drifts, particularly in comparison to the types of accuracy that we're interested in uh, estimating. There are some techniques where you can remove this drift. So, for example, uh, this paper by Emma Worthington looked at detrending de or de-drifting the ocean bottom pressure instruments using GRACE. And there's also emergency tech, emerging technology, uh, such as the Zero A sensor, which um, it provides a long-term calibration or a long-term stability or no a long-term calibration point really of the bottom pressure instrument by every so often switching to atmospheric pressure so that you have a control point that you can calibrate your instrument against and with these you ha would have a long-term estimate of um, uh, a long-term estimate of a deep bottom pressure Now, there is a place, of course, for good old fashioned hydrography. Um, the figure I'm showing here is taken from a paper by Maria uh, Casanova Massa Joanne. Uh, Maria was actually killed tragically in, a, in, a, in an accident, in a scuba diving accident just last week. So it's a terrible loss for, um, for our friends and family and colleagues in the Canary Islands and, and for the community at large. Um, in her paper here, what she did was take hydrographic sections north of Iceland from 1993 to the present to estimate the, the circulation of the Atlantic water inflow to the North Icelandic arming of current there. So there was, um, what this has really added is, is that it had a, a, a much better spatial coverage than the moorings that had previously been used for estimating this circulation. And a long-term trend was noted in this paper. So that's, that's a bit of a departure. So there's 
typically the exchanges across the Greenland Scotland Ridge have been very, very stable. Um, and so this long term trend in this current and the Atlantic water entering the Nordic seas here is of note. So there is still a place for ships and seaboard 911s. And I, I just chose to show this this figure rather than uh, say, for example, the Ovid section is another good example of where long term hydrography can really contribute to understanding um, understanding the long term changes in terms of AMOC and associated fluxes. There are a number of additional technologies that are not currently being used in terms of um, uh, long term uh, uh, AMOC observing arrays uh, or, or that are just beginning to be integrated into them. So, for example, ADCPs on ships of opportunity. This is a very nice example from a recent paper led by Leon Traffic, um, where they found this pathway coming of a deep flow through the Faroe, through the Faroe Shetland Channel. Um, along the Norwegian slope. Um, and this is a lovely figure from that paper, which is based on vessel mounted ADCP from the Norana, which is a, a ferry um, that travels approximately between Shetland and Faroe Islands. Um, and this is a really nice example of how these volunteering observing ships can provide important estimations of the circulation and could potentially be um, part of an observing system. Now, of course, the one problem with that is that uh, commercial ships are not, of course, deployed uh, specifically for making oceanographic measurements. So every so often they change their path or change their course. Um, but I think probably with the emergence of autonomous vehicles that potentially this type of observation could make a very valuable contribution, particularly in the shallower regions um, of the of the ocean. So mentioning uh, additional technologies would not be complete without mentioning AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles, and particularly, I suppose, a special note of gli for gliders. So there's a picture of um, a glider that we had deployed over the summer, actually, um, led by the Irish Marine Institute, measuring the slope current southwest of Ireland. Um, and these, these are excellent uh, tools, particularly for capturing the very sm fine spatial scale um, of circulation, so important elements of the circulation. Um, for example, this figure is taken from uh, Lloyd Cooper uh, and co-author's paper looking at the structure of the North Atlantic Current around the Rockall Plateau. So that's looking in around here. And what they found was that there are a number of these very narrow jets um, around the Rockall, um, Rockall Plateau. So if you look at this jet here, for example, you can see this is one degree of longitude, so 100 kilometers or so, and this is an exceptionally narrow jet. Now, because gliders are the way they are, they make very dense spatial measurements. This is the type of stuff you'd completely miss if you were out in a ship um, making hydro hydrographic measurements, unless you were very lucky, of course, well, where you would have a 50 kilometer spacing between stations. Um, so this this type of this type of uh, observation can really complement what's going on in terms of um, measuring these very short, small, narrow jets that can be very, so that can provide a, quite a substantial amount of the transport of uh, uh, major, uh, major elements of the circulation. So that is essentially what currently available and um, there's still a number of things that are missing. So, for example, many of the shelf edge and shelf seas are not routinely observed as part of these AMOC observing systems. So starting at the shelf edge again, if we're starting here around the shelf edge around uh, just off the coast of Scotland, this is part of the OSNAP array. So this is the eastern boundary of the OSNAP array. Um, this is a lovely shiny mooring being deployed uh, in a trawl resistant or trawl, um, well, resistant is always a bit of an over exaggeration, but it, it, in a trawl um, protective protective mount. This was uh, found by an underwater uh, survey afterwards looking a little bit like this, which uh, is not probably serving any useful oceanographic purpose other than 
a niche for the bio biology that's living inside it at the moment. So this is deployed in, um, in around the shelf edge. You can see in the top right here exactly where it was deployed, capturing this current here in the slope current. Um, and the thing about slope current is it's a wonderfully rich and productive region, which means there's loads of fish and also means there's loads of fishermen. So it's actually quite a difficult place to do any Onshore, so not on the shelf edge, but on, on the shelf itself, there are very few observations as part of these AMOC observing systems that are actually on the shelf. Now, there are plenty of locations where measurements on the shelf are not needed, but there are also elements where it's important. So, for example, the East Greenland shelf is a very important part of the, um, of the, the global circulation, but it's very difficult to make observations there. So we still, are, we still do have gaps in certain locations. I've also mentioned the deep ocean here as well. So there are, of course, two cells in the overturning circulation, the, um, the primary cell, but also the Antarctic bottom water driven cell. And we don't really observe that bottom cell. It, it's quite difficult to do. Um, and well, I would say that's probably maybe a bit down to the list of the priorities. So those were essentially observational gaps. There is also parametric gaps in terms of, um, in terms of AMOC observing. So first one is biogeochemistry. So for many years, really, biogeochemistry was only done in hydrographic surveys on, on research vessels. And it's only in recent years that the technology has been emerging that can make continuous estimates of biogeochemistry. Uh, the figure here, I think it came from Ben Mote in NOC, um, shows the deployment of some biogeochemical instrumentation as part of the ABC. Uh, Fluxes project, which put biogeochemical sensors on the rapid array. So that is beginning to bear some, some results and it has enabled the calculation of nutrient and anthropogenic carbon transports across the section at high resolution and contributed to new understandings of how the AMOC regulates the efficiency of the North Atlantic's biological carbon pump. Uh, on the right hand side is another, another kind of gap that we have, which is telemetry. So, for example, there's no website I can log on to and check how strong the AMOC is at the moment. And uh, I'm not sure how widespread the desire to do that would be, but uh, I'd certainly like to do it anyway. Uh, there's a kind of a more serious uh, element to that, too. If AMOC estimates were coming back in near real time, there would be a data security advantage to it. There would also be um, the potential for integration into more real time forecasting estimates. So we know, you know, from the field of decadal forecasting, but ocean circulation is essentially where uh, most of the where most of the predictability comes from, um, and so potentially uh, getting data back in near real time from an AMOC observing system would be of great benefit. Start wrapping up so we can have time for Q and A. I will do. So as I said, I was going to start at the end and uh, end at the start. So a few slides for motivation. So. Um, why do we me measure the AMOC? Well, we measure the AMOC because it is still predicted to decline due to anthropogenic climate change. So this is uh, CMIP 6. All of these lines go down in the future, and that means that the AMOC is still predicted to decline. So the AMOC is still predicted to decline, and there is some evidence kind of growing, kind of consistent element that uh, from paleo and instrumental sources that the AMOC is at its weakest in a thousand years. So what do long term AMOC observation systems have to say about that? Well, they kind of don't really say the same thing. So this paper from Ben Moat in 2020 showed that in spite of rapid showing a decreasing AMOC for the first, you know, maybe uh, maybe 10 years of, of observations, it's really been strengthening since then. And when you look at the whole time series, it's probably been strengthening since 2010 or so. Uh, so the AMOC is, so it's not only the AMOC, I guess. So there are some strange things happening in the Atlantic. We've had the coldest anomaly uh, on record in 2015, the freshest in 120 years in 2016. And this um, understanding the AMOC and what the role of the AMOC is in all of these is a very important, uh, a very important question. Okay, so this is my final slide. And I realize I've gone a good bit over time. Um, this is our AMOC ocean observing system. Um, and I guess, so I guess one of the questions is like, are we at the stage of having an AMOC ocean observing system in, in that kind of systematic sense 
and probably we're not really at this stage. There still isn't any kind of umbrella body which kind of coordinates and says, this is what you need to do to make measurements of the AMOC. And probably we shouldn't either, because I think it's important to kind of retain the scientific focus rather than being an observing system that's going to contribute an essential climate variable or something like that. Um, the scientific questions and the scientific community around the AMOC is very entwined. Um, so I noticed, um, hopefully they're still there, but I noticed a lot of modelers had logged on at the start of this. And the, the community between the observationists and the modelers are quite entwined in terms of AMOC observing, which means that it can be a very kind of scientifically focused and scientifically motivated. And then technologically, I think flexibility is important. Transport mooring arrays have really dominated AMOC observing, but whether that will always be the case going into the future is probably not, not clear at all. And I think being technologically flexible is really what you need to be uh, going forwards. So I'll leave that there and I'll call my co-authors for their contributions through the whole process. Thank you, Gerard. Let's take 10 minutes. Uh, if you have 10 minutes for a QA. and a uh, reminder, if you do have a question, use the raise your hand button. There's a question in the chat box from Ronellas Perez. She says, great talk, Gerard. What would be the optimal depth for the bottom pressure measurements to be made on the boundaries if you use them as part of a long-term AMOC observing system at multiple latitudes? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think Chris's paper uh, looked really at bottom pressure measurements along the slope. So actually actually along the slope, not so much at, uh, on the abyssal plane or up on the shelf, but really along the slope all the way along. And I think there's kind of um, in, in that figure, if I go back a few, um, you can see kind of where it, uh, he was looking at. Uh, so really, it was kind of quite quite close to the shelf and along the slope here, uh, a bit more spread out here, but that's mainly to do with the topography getting a lot shallower up around the Greenland Scotland Ridge. So it is really kind of this kind of a long, a long slope region. Thanks. Um, any other questions as we wait for Simon's question to be typed? All right, question from David Marshall. Go ahead. Um, hi, Jared. That was a really great talk. Um, so my question was was more about the the longer term. So in your penultimate slide, you you said it's not just the AMOC we care about, but of course a lot of other things as well. In the atmosphere, we don't have a poleward heat transport observing system. We we have a, a global network of observations and analyses and reanalyses. And I think in, back in 2004, when Rapid was starting out, the reanalysis, ocean reanalyses just weren't up to the job. But over the last few years, and I see this as a success actually of Rapid and the, the other time series, those products have done much, much better at, at reproducing the time series that we're observing. So I wondered if you look 10, 20 years into the future, at what point do you think we transition to more of a sort of operational global observing system? where we were taking routine observations globally and using those to derive um, metrics such as the AMOC at different latitudes. So I think uh, you're dead right in terms of, um, you know, the great advances that have happened in, in terms of ocean reanalysis. I'm not sure that the, the reanalysis is quite there yet. And in particular, um, in certain locations, um, they, they do still struggle. I mean, it's not that long since there was quite a quite a zoo in terms of um, the you know the types of coherence that you saw in terms of a AMOC, uh, in terms of the transports that you get ac across some of these very small constricted and very important regions such as the Fairbank Channel in the deep Denmark Straits, and of course reanalysis are only built on the strength of the observations that go into them. So um, we do still have quite a few observing gaps in in terms of the observational systems. So um, I guess. I would say that um, you're, you probably have a more optimistic view than I do in terms of the uh, strength of the reanalysis as it stands. Um, I think there has been a number of, of projects, you know, that have looked at, you know, different ways to integrate or to to use kind of direct transport estimates, and that hasn't really worked very well. So, I mean, there is a kind of a, a, a good idea that the transport estimates maybe should stay independent of the reanalysis, but that means you still have to keep keep making them so that you, they can be compared independently. Um, I would say I don't see kind of a way forward straight at the moment. Um, that would directly feed into reanalysis. I would say we're quite a bit away from that yet. Thank you. 
There are a couple questions in the chat box. So one from Simon. How about measuring at 40 north? Do we need more observations there to understand the coherence breakdown? Um, so I guess we've got measurements at uh, Noack Array, which is what, 47 degrees north. I mean, there there is a there is a breakdown across the the boundary between the subtropical and the subpolar North Atlantic. Um, there are, of course, coherences, uh, so we know that the same water masses get down from the subpolar North Atlantic to the subtropical North Atlantic. So there there is coherence on some time scale. Do we need more observations at forty degrees north? Um, I would probably not necessarily say so. I think we need to have a better understanding of the connection between, say, a subtropical estimate rapid and a subpolar estimate, be it that from 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 the work or from, from OSNAP. Um, I think that uh, you know, kind of, I think we can join the dots successfully without actually uh, throwing in a new uh, array camp anywhere around there. Um, another question. I'm sorry if I mispronounced their name. Um, from I think it's Garof Madden. What kind of impact will enhanced overturning in the Southern Ocean may have on AMOC? And do we see any trends and observations in CMIT six results? Um, so uh, I don't. I'm not familiar with any CMIP six results that talk about ACC. I've only really read that paper from um, from Vayar et al. Looking at the the AMOC at 26 north, where we do see, or well, the the AMOC in the Atlantic, where we do see the um, slowdown similar to CMIP five. Uh, what contribution will the ACC have? Um, I don't know actually, um, and I think that's that's a very interesting kind of idea from an from an AMOC observing. So we, we have been talking about an AMOC observing. Of course, there's no need for it necessarily to be an an A as in an Atlantic MOC observing. Uh, there are you know, the, the Southern Ocean and the ACC is such an integral part of the global overturning circulation that it'd be wonderful to have uh, observational networks down there that are that are also integrating with the picture that we're building up uh, of the Atlantic overturning circulation. Okay, great. And let's end this webinar with a final question from B. Bergs. Um, can we build on the coherence principles better to improve our overturning metrics based on combinations from different TMAs? Um, so I guess the TMAs have, for uh, in a large amount, they're they're sufficiently separate that they are, um, given the time scales that they've been established for, that they are kind of observing slightly different variability um, as it stands. So, for example, um, there's no very obvious link between the time series at OSNAP and Rapid as it stands. Um, Whereas when you look down at between rapid and move, which are two slightly longer time series, you can see that the same density anomalies propagate between the two of them. So can we use that coherence? I think we can, I think it's a kind of an important comparison to be made, but there's quite a lot of work to be done in terms of really, I suppose, um, identifying the coherence signals from the um, more disjointed or maybe even externally atmospherically driven signals. So, you know, the AMOC, um, I guess kind of has gone through a bit of a ring or backwards and forwards. Maybe if you went back to Wally Brooker's idea of the, the AMOC being one kind of continuous stream, that's kind of been uh, successively broken down by by people looking at it in a bit more detail. Um, say Bingham and Hughes looking at the, the breakdown of, so so that I, I showed that figure from Bingham and Bingham et al uh, to show that there was a lot of coherence in the AMOC, but in fact, they were showing it to show that there was actually not so much coherence in the AMOC as in that it did break up across the subtropical and subpolar um, North Atlantic. And then if you went to the, the work of Amy Bauer and uh, Susan Lozier deconstructing the AMOC and the pathways that are involved in it. Uh, so it's kind of been broken down and I think we're putting it back together bit by bit as well at the same time, so that we can see that this connection between, um, we can see this connection between, uh, you know, transport mooring arrays that are separated by, um, you know, large, large distances. And we can begin to join the dots between you know, what's uh, water masses that are occurring or water masses that are changing in the eastern subpolar gyre and going through the Faroe, uh, Faroe Shetland Channel and, and so forth. 
Okay, great. I think that will end today's webinar series. So big thank you to Gerard for your presentation. Um, and I thank you to everyone else for participating. Um, the next AMOC webinar will be on November 19th with a talk by Paula Mafa Sanchez on the on the paper Variability in the Northern North Atlantic and Arctic Oceans across the two across the last two millennia a review um, so we hope to see you there next month and in the chat box i included a link that will send you to, to the list of our the webinar schedule and I'll also a list of our past recordings so thank you again gerard for your presentation and thank you thank you everybody